I'm Richard Brown from Mississippi State University, and along with Christy Yeager, we're pleased to begin with a presentation with an overview of Lepidoptera. Identification of Lepidoptera and understanding how they behave and how they live is often dependent upon knowledge of the morphology. Today I will talk about the morphology and structures of the head, the thorax, the wings and the legs, and the abdomen, especially the male and female genitalia, and also about male sex scales. These scales are very important sometimes for identification. The head, as with the rest of the body, is covered with scales. And so you see in the photograph on the left the various structures, maxillary palpi, the labial palpi, and the proboscis, but on the right, you see them much better after the scales are removed. The labial palpi are large, three-segmented in most Lepidoptera. The maxillary palpi are lost and reduced in many. First, the ocelli. Many of the Lepidoptera have families in which ocelli are present or absent, but some are generally uh, consistent in having ocelli, such as the Noctuidae. In contrast, the notodontidae that can be somewhat similar don't have ocelli. You find ocelli always in some groups present or absent in others and then generally absent in other families of Lepidoptera. The palpi take on different postures. Sometimes they're drooping, hanging down, and others they are recurved like the Gilichaeids, uh, strongly curved in front of the head. And others, they are correct, sticking out straight from the head. If we look at these palpi and take the scales off, we see a strange structure at the inside of the third segment. It's an invagination that has the name organ of Vom Roth. Now, this organ of Vom Roth is present throughout most of the Lepidoptera, but we don't know for sure just what it does. There's been speculation, but here is a whole sensory organ that we don't know how it operates and what's its function. Antennae come in a variety of forms from the clubbed, as we have in butterflies, to pectinate, or sometimes called feathery, to filiform. The pectinate antennae can have one branch per segment or two, in which we refer to it as bipectinate. The male of the Lepidopter has more sensilla. And generally, if you look at an individual segment of the antenna, as shown here in the scanning electron micrograph, you see almost half of it is covered by the sensella. There's eight different types. And they, some of them are gustatory, and some of them are olfactory. So a lot of different functions are used by these sensella on the antenna. The proboscis can be scaled, as is true for the pyroloids and the galicioid uh, superfamilies. In most Lepidoptera, however, it's naked. This is a very good character for distinguishing uh, pyralids, for example, from other families that may appear to be similar. The thorax has the three segments, the prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax. It's that middle segment that's the large one. That's the one that holds the four wings, and it's got a very complex endoskeleton. And it's also useful because that's where we put a pin through the moth, and it holds onto the pin quite well. If we look at the metathorax, we see something very interesting. The anterior portion of the metathorax, the metascutum, doesn't have scales. It's got these long uh, projections, blade-like, that we refer to as microtrichia. And these microtrichia lock in with other microtrichia on the forewing. So there is a locking mechanism between the metathorax and the forewing. Looking at the forewing, this is the base of the forewing at the underside, the ventral side, and you see this bare area. This is throughout most of the Lepidoptera. It's not in butterflies, it's not in silk moths, it's not in sphinx moths, but many others have this bare area that when enlarged 
you see these macrotrichia. Now macrotrichia are these projections. They don't have sockets. They're not like a seta. They're not sensory. It's a physical structure and in this case used for locking on with the macrotrichia on the thorax. Now why they do this? Because it's only done when they're resting. It's still not quite known but uh, I've speculated perhaps it's to keep the wings close to the body, especially in cooler temperatures or higher altitudes. When we uh, have a breeze, that can move the wings, and so they have a physical locking mechanism to keep those wings around their body. I became interested in four-wing patterns several years ago, and a recent student, Sandra Sashek, has followed this up in looking at the wing patterns in primitive moths that have six bands or fascia crossing the wing. Most Lepidoptera have five. Not all moths have fascia. Some have none. Some have spots. There's a lot of variation, but I'm going to show you examples of how a basic wing pattern, the generalized wing pattern, can be greatly modified by addition of color between the fascia, by fragmentation, breaking up the fascia, and other factors. For example, if we look at this tortricid moth, we see the basal and subbasal fascia that are separate. But in a related species, there's suffusion in between and we have what's called a basal patch. This can extend up through the median fascia and we can have this kind of pattern or it can extend between all fascia to have a completely uniformly dark wing. Understanding the wing patterns and being able to identify the different components can be very important for identifying species. The thorax also has the hind wings from the, meta, the metathorax and you can tell differences between the sexes with the males having a single spine coming from the base of the hind wing and hooking onto a little latch on the underside of the front wing. Females have three or multiple spines. There's exceptions. So you can look at the underside and determine if it's a male or female. The wing venation is critical for identifying some families of moths. And uh, we see that there are six major veins. The subcosta, the radius, sometimes today we refer to the radius and the radial sector instead of R, 2, 3, 4, 5, we say RS1, RS2, RS3, etc. But these, these vena venation uh, terms are what we find in textbooks using the radius. There are three medial veins, two cubital anterior veins, one posterior cubital, and then an anal vein or more. So this basic venation you will get experience with in our laboratory session and learning how to identify families using these veins. There's variations, for example, the cubitus may appear four-branched in which the M1, M is separated from M2, and M2 and M3 are closer together to than any other vein. There are also stock veins. There can be veins that are completely fused. You can have loss of veins, lots of variation. The legs, beginning with the foreleg, has an epiphysis that's unique to the Lepidoptera. And if you take the scales off, you can see this little projection that are used, some think, for cleaning the antenna. The hind leg has four tibial spurs, whereas the middle leg has two spurs. And the number of spurs can differ between families. If we look at the pretarsus, I refer to this as the toes of the, of the moth, we see that there's a claw, there's a pulvalis, and a aureolum. Uh, the pulvalis is something that can aid it landing on rough surfaces and holding on. The aureolum will actually give off a compound that makes it adhere to a smooth surface, and on a pane of glass, the moth can hold up to eight times its weight because of the ability to adhere to a surface. A tympanum can be found on the metathorax in the noctuoidea, whereas in two other superfamilies, it's on the abdomen. The abdomen, of course, includes the male genitalia. These are especially important for species recognition, but also for identifying genera as well as families.
There's a lot of structures, a lot of different structures, and you find different terms for different families and it can become confusing. Here are some of the major structures that we use, beginning with the important phallus, also previously known as the ediagus. The phallus is the intermittent organ for introducing the sperm into the female. The uncus is the structure at the top that helps latch on to the female, as do the soci, and then the valvae, on each side, which operate rather like a clam shell, opening and closing around the end of the abdomen of the female to hold it in place while mating occurs. And finally, a common structure of the valva is a cuculus, an enlarged area that has many diagnostic characters. There's variations in different families. In noctuids, for example, you can have a development of the saccus projecting ventrally in this image. Also, the phallus of all Lepidoptera have a, ves a vesica. It's a membranous uh, extension that is withdrawn into the sclerotized portion, but everted during mating. And this phallus is critical, uh, the vesica is critical for identification of certain economic pests. You can have, within one family, an uncus that's bifid or it's completely lost. You can have an others the valvae that are divided into two parts, lots of variation, very important for identification. The female genitalia have the two genital openings. There's one opening for mating, for the male phallus, that inserts the sperm into the bursa copulatrix as a spermatophore. The sperm leave the spermatophore and migrate to the bullus seminalis and on to the spermatheca, where they individually fertilize the eggs that pass from the ovary down the oviduct. The genitalia has many structures important for identification. The uh, first of these is the osteum bursa that's surrounded by a sterigma, the sclerotized plate. And this occurs right behind posterior to the seventh abdominal sternite. Here we see the ductus bursa that the sperm, spermatophore uh, travels into the corpus bursa. The spermatophore is held in place by these thorn-like cygna in many species, and the form of these cygna uh, is diagnostic. And lastly, the papillae annales. These, sometimes called the ovipositor pads, have a lot of sensory CD on them and can perhaps sense the texture of the plant and physical characteristics of the plant. And the papillae annales are, again, very diagnostic. And sometimes you can even tell the host by the form of the papillae annales. They can insert eggs into buds. They can use these papillae annales for scraping the surface to cover their eggs with debris. This is another species in the same family, just showing you the type of variation that's present within two species of the same family. Wing scales we know about covering the whole body of the Lepidoptera. If you look at an individual wing scale with a scanning electron microscope, you see that it's got longitudinal ridges. Scales are found throughout many groups of insects. Mosquitoes have scales. There's even some lice that have scales. There's scales in weevils and beetles and many, even in ants. But none of these scales and the other insects have scoots. The longitudinal ridge is divided by these individual little projections and that's peculiar to the Lepidoptera. Sometimes we refer to hairs on the body of the moth or fringe that is hair-like, but these are actually just round scales or pilliform scales. You can see the scoots. It's a scale, even though it's round and hair-like. Of great interest to me are male sex scales. We know a lot about the female pheromones. There's been tremendous amount of research Female pheromones have been identified for numerous species, especially agricultural pests, and that's often the way we sample and survey for pest species by using the female pheromone to attract the male. However, males also have pheromones, 
that are used at close range. And these pheromones are produced by glandular scales that are often in a pocket, almost always in a pocket protected area. There are disseminator scales that then will pick up the pheromone and disperse it like a wick. And these disseminator scales can be in the same pocket or in a different structure. For example, the glandular scales may be in a pocket of the abdomen and the disseminator long hair pencil like scales will be on the hind leg and they stick those pencils in the pocket on the abdomen, pull it out and wick out this pheromone. And then there are some in which the glandular scales and the disseminator scales are all incorporated together. Here's an example of the genus Cydia. It's the genus that includes the codling moth, the apple codling moth. This is looking at the ventral side of the hind wing of a cydia. If we look at the dorsal side, we see that this pocket has an opening and sticking into that pocket are these long spine-like projections. If we open up that pocket, take a thin razor and cut it open and flip it open, that's what we see. Giant scales inside that pocket. And these giant scales, when we look at them with scanning electron microscope, appear like this. Not like a normal scale. And we actually see stuff coming out of the windows. Scales have windows so you can see the color pigment inside. But these scales have a substance being extruded through the window. I have seen this numerous times on many different species and you can even see the scale appearing coated as though it was dipped in hot chocolate and dried. When those hair pencils stick into the pocket, they are modified. Instead of just a single little window between those longitudinal ridges, it's become just perforated. This aids the dissemination of the chemical by providing a much larger surface area in which to disperse the chemical. Here's another example. You can see the scoots of the longitudinal ridges, so we know it's similar to the wing scale, but it's just greatly elaborated. In the false conning moth, one of the species that we often survey for, we see the hind leg has a characteristic clumping of scales, and if we zero in on that group of scales, we see a pocket diversity of scales. Further, if we go and look at these individual scales in the pocket, and enlarge them. There are six different kinds and this is one type. I call this like the griddle scale. This is a finger-like scale and note how those longitudinal ridges instead of being parallel are sinuate. That increases the surface area. If you measure the length of a sinuate longitudinal ridge versus a, a straight one, it greatly increases the surface area for dissemination of the compound. In summary, we have talked about the major tagma, the head, thorax, abdomen, their appendages, and other structures that are important for identification of Lepidoptera, especially the sex scales that include uh, structures that can be used for identifying some of our pest species. These are some references and other resources, including two videos on how to dissect the male and female genitalia of moths that are accessible online. Thank you. Are there any questions? Why do males have more sensilla than females? The males have more plumose antennae compared with females, and their antennal segments have more surface exposed and not scaled because the males use many of these sensilla for detecting the female pheromone and they can detect this and fly, follow the plume for hundreds of yards, if not up to a quarter mile or longer. In order to recognize the differences in pheromones, for example, they would need very precise sensilla, and perhaps many of them. And even so, the sensilla on the antenna of the female are important, but the males typically have more. Why do the forewing and the thorax have a locking mechanism? No one really has experimentally demonstrated why, but it would make sense that when the moth is at rest and the wings are locked 
to, with, to the thorax. It's important that they not move around when every little breeze or gust of wind came along. Otherwise, they would have to use energy and muscular muscles to hold the wings tight around the body, especially in higher elevations where it might be cold. Those wings provide a blanket for thermal regulation. So having a physical locking mechanism saves energy. The wings don't move around or expose the moth to potential predators. And this could well be a good reason that they have this wing thoracic locking mechanism. Are there other ways besides the frenulum to separate the sexes? Not all moths, and in fact, all the butterflies lack a frenulum. So how do we tell the sexes? And just as uh, I have mentioned before, the males typically have more sincilla on the antenna. If it's pectinate, more, uh, it's pectinate more in the male. But I often just look at the tail end because the male will have sort of clam-like claspers that can open and close for holding the female while mating. And you can see the split between the two valvae by the scale patterns. It's, oh, it's got valvae. In contrast, the female has these very setos ovipositor pads. And if you look at the tail end, but sometimes you would need a microscope, you can see those ovipositor pads with a lot of CD coming from them. And you know, I've got a female. And typically the female's abdomen is more tapered to a point than the male that's wider.